Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Andy. Good evening, Stella. <laughs> Good to see all of you in the service tonight. Good to see Andy and Sherilyn back. Good to see all of you here. Welcome. Why don't we bow our heads and invite God's presence. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in your house on Wednesday night. We come from busy lives and we come from lots of things that that uh, tire us and wear us out and all of those things, but we come tonight for a spiritual refreshing. So we pray that you would make that so tonight. Have your way and we'll praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Let me just mention this while I'm thinking about it so I don't forget. Many of you know that Rick and Mary had a real tragedy in their family and uh, they're down there with their daughter and, uh, and she's been in the hospital uh, just so distraught, doing some better and we're grateful for that. But Rick and Mary have had, and some of you have asked me, this is the reason I mentioned this, if, if there's a way to help and uh, they've been having to stay in a motel, of course, there were all kinds of things, that uh, expenses that, uh, that they didn't have any idea were coming. So if anybody wants to help, you can do it any way you want to. I think there's a GoFundMe. I'm not really acquainted with that method of doing it, but I know Rick has a PayPal. You can give it directly if you want credit for it as a contribution. You can give it as a benevolent gift and give it to the church. Just make sure you mark it and we will make sure it gets to them quickly. So just mention that. So if you uh, have interest in helping at uh, Rick and Mary, we're here Sunday night and uh, had no idea, but about eight o'clock Sunday night, their daughter called and, and it was just, just unbelievable. So they drove through the night to get there and have been there since. So appreciate your prayers for them. And that's just information if you want to help. All right, let's get our song books. Yes. Yes, yes. Many of you may not know that her first husband died in a uh, in an ac a diving accident of some kind, and uh, several years ago, and so she's been through an, an awful lot. And uh, so we we want to pray for her, and uh, and for Rick and Mary. We'll do that, of course, during prayer time. Let's sing together. I think Andy's going to lead us tonight. So. All right, take your hymnal. We're going to turn to hymn number three seventy seven. Thank you for your prayers for the Tallmans. I know they appreciate it during this difficult time. And if the Lord would move upon you to, to bless them in some way, I know that that would be a blessing to them. We're going to sing tonight and we're going to do testimony time during the same time instead of doing testimony time later. And uh, so we are going to sing 377. And, uh, and there's a lot that... Uh, a lot of testimonies that could come right out of 377 about Jesus saves, satisfies, takes away my sadness, guilt is gone, peace is mine. Once a slave, now I'm free. There's a lot that can be uh, that many could testify about in this in this song, 377. And so we are going to do that one, and then we are going to do a couple of choruses as well. And uh, so we're going to uh, do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing this song, and then I'm going to stop, see if there's any testimonies. And if not, we're going to move to choruses. We'll sing a couple choruses back to back. Stop, see if there's testimonies. If not, we'll keep going. And if we get all through the song services with no testimony, then good luck. You'll just have to make room for it somewhere else in the service, all right? So let's sing this together, 377.
Lord, I'm so grateful. I don't really think of that as a Christmas song, but we could sing that as a Christmas song, couldn't we? Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. Well, I'm so grateful that he is that to us. Anybody want to give God praise tonight? Something in those verses or chorus you want to give God praise about? Amen. Yes, Sherry, go right ahead. Yes, praise God. Praise the Lord. That's right. Praise the Lord. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Sherry, for that wonderful testimony. And uh, we certainly, Brother Stetler will be mentioning this in prayer time, but we certainly want to remember Frank, the passing of his son recently. And so we want to pray the Lord would give special help in this difficult time. Amen. Anybody else want to give God praise? Yes, Joan, go right ahead. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. That's exactly right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, I'm grateful for that reality. Name written in the book of life. Praise God. All right. Anybody else? Yes. Brooke, go right ahead. Yes. <laughs> Praise God, Brooke. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, Brother Evan, go right ahead. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Evan. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Yes. You're right. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Evan. Well, we are to live to the glory of God, aren't we? And then we are to declare His glory. Praise the Lord. All right. Yes, Betty, go right ahead. Yes, praise God. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's take our chorus book. We're going to sing chorus number 169 and 170. And uh, then if somebody else has a testimony, we'll be happy to... Uh, here you give the Lord praise. 169, oh, His grace is sufficient for me. I'm grateful for His grace. Let's sing it together. 169. Oh, His grace.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anybody else want to give God praise? Amen. All right. Yes. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> it's abundant, isn't it? And available. Praise God for His grace. Hallelujah. All right. You ready to sing a couple more courses? Anybody else? Yes, Sister Albertson. Yes. Yes, praise God. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Bless your heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Sister Winkler. Yes, amen. Amen. Sure, praise the Lord. He is enough. Hallelujah. No matter, I don't know the circumstances of your life, but I can tell you boldly on the word of God, he is enough. He is enough. All right, let's sing course number, uh, let's see here, course number 171. He's the lily when I'm in the valley. Let's lift that together. He's the lily. else want to give God praise I'm grateful that he's going to take us through yes. amen yes. we just hold on <laughs> Paul says I kept the faith I finished the course but I kept the faith yes, amen praise the Lord yes 
Yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> Absolutely. He'll take me through. Hallelujah. All right, let's sing just a couple more. Let's sing number 178, My God is Enough. And then we're going to conclude with 179, Because He Lives. 178. <clears throat> say, why do you sing so loud sitting up there on the platform? I can hear you above everybody. <laughs> and I say, well, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. That's the reason to sing as loud as you can sing. <laughs> when I get done singing in congregation, I can only hardly have a voice left. <clears throat> I don't remember who it was, but somebody just met him in Brother Buckler, telling about uh, a man that he talked to that had never heard that a person could be freed from sin. He had heard a person could be forgiven, but he had never heard a person that a person can be cleansed from the nature of sin. And he said, well, I've never heard that before, but I guess if God could raise Jesus from the dead, he could just do anything he wanted to do. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, now that's a pretty good answer because he lives. That that's, makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Praise the Lord. Well, because he lives, 
you can face tomorrow and I can face tomorrow. And whatever that means. And sometimes it means big things. It means big things for us tomorrow. But because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Amen. Well, we want to pray together. Brother Steve Smith, would you lead us, please? I've got quite a list of pr uh, prayer requests here, and I'm just going to go down through them. And uh, we sure don't think that Steve has to name all of these in his prayer time. But I do want you to, I do want you to think about them and make note of them and pray for them in the days ahead. Uh, as God would lay it on your heart. Of course, we want to remember the Tallmans and uh, Rick and Mary and Julia and her two sisters and all the family that are going through difficult, difficult days. Let's pray for them. Regina has surgery in the morning. We have to be in Louisville at 730. And uh, so it, there comes a time when it's not going to do any good to, to Google it on YouTube or Google on on Google and read about it and try to figure it all out and <laughs> you just got to go do it so uh, i'd appreciate your prayers for her yes. there are several other requests of course we want to remember eli and ellie and iliana as they're in honduras and uh, and ask the lord to just use them in a mighty way and uh, i don't know i kind of think we ought to have Eli preach when he gets back and have Ellie interpret into Spanish for him. I, don't know, I would like, I would like to hear that. <laughs> so, but I don't know if anybody would, but Sister Hill would understand the Spanish unless Brother Sankey's here. But, but, uh, but anyway, let's do pray for them as they minister there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So there's, there's a, several other requests <clears throat> that I want to remember. Uh, Andy mentioned a mo moment ago Frank, and uh, Frank lost his only son uh, a few days ago, and he lived in California, and Frank wasn't even notified uh, by the family initially when that happened. And so that's a, been a, an emotional thing. So let's remember Frank especially and ask God to touch him and, and encourage him and help him. Then there's a Hoff Power family. I don't remember her first name. Brit Brittany uh, Hoff Power. They attended here a number of years ago when they were at GBS, but she passed away, uh, three uh, fairly young children, and don't know the circumstances of her passing, but God knows all about that. So let's remember that family as we pray. Then uh, I want us to remember Jeffrey Brewer. Jeffrey is job hunting, lost his job, and God knows about that, knows he needs a job, so let's pray that he would find just the right job. And Jeffrey, we have prayed over 30 years. I can't tell you how many people we've prayed about a job situation in 30 years. And again and again, we've, we've watched God answer that prayer. He's answered it, hadn't he, David? And uh, David was at work for some time, and God gave him a good job, and I'm very grateful. Amen. And different ones, that has been the case. So we're going to pray. For Jeffrey as we pray tonight. Then there's a number of, of uh, physical needs. The Sabo's neighbor had uh, surgery and they're asking for prayer for their neighbor. Uh, we want to remember the Sankeys and uh, Andy has, has invited several older guys and him to eat together for breakfast, <laughs> several of us older guys, and Andy, <laughs> he's not one of the older guys. <laughs> but uh, Brother Sankey, uh, with, with his breathing issues, uh, he, he decided to try to do it at the Sankey's house. And we offered to cook, and when Sister Sankey said, no, I'll cook breakfast if you guys want to come. So uh, Andrew and myself, and Brother Witt, and Brother Sutherland, and Brother Sankey, uh, ate breakfast together and it was such a such a precious time and brother Sankey just thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it uh, but but I'll just tell you this he when he got up that morning that was a Tuesday morning uh, he said I just wasn't sure I was going to make it for the breakfast and he said I just couldn't get my breath and he took a dose of medicine that's supposed to help and it he got he got to the table and got through it and enjoyed it and participated in the conversation but finally he said man i'm fading i'm gonna have to go lay down so uh 
But Brother Sankey is, and he was struggling to get his breath then real bad. So let's remember them. Brother and Sister Sankey both need our prayers. Continue to remember uh, Brother and Sister Witt. Continue to remember Reese Litchfield. Continue to remember Sister uh, Albertson. Continue to remember Retha. Uh, <clears throat> Sister Cooper. Mike Yeary. Uh, I want us to remember Betty Lawson. She mentioned, testified tonight. She's been struggling. Uh, her blood work is good, but her heart issue has been troubling her. So, uh, and she is told by her family doctor that she's got a different kind of arrhythmia. And I've been down that road long enough to know, I know there are several different, different branches that can branch off and kinds of arrhythmia you can have. So she's scheduled, or going to schedule to see a, a specialist uh, that deals with that kind of arrhythmia. So, uh, so let's pray that God would help the doctor to know what to do to help Betty. She's just been so weak and, and almost fainty at times. So let's remember uh, Betty as we pray tonight. We want to remember Michelle Witt's daddy. She, we mentioned this Sunday he had uh, got hit by a car on his bicycle and he's still suffering. So we want to remember uh, that. Shamira needs our prayer, continued prayers. We want to remember her tonight. We want to remember Bryantsburg camp going on this week. And uh, if you can get down to Bryantsburg camp, you would enjoy Brother, uh, brother uh, Stevens. Yes, Brother Stevens' ministry. So go if you possibly can. And then the Lopers are also in a camp. And I've been mentioning uh, from time to time, let's pray for camps. Uh, Bryantsburg camp's going on. Uh, Let's camp is going on. Uh, Victory camp starts. No, it's going on now. The Lopers are at Victory camp in Virginia. Uh, I know those three. I know there are others that I may not. But let's pray that God would come in our camps across the country and, and, uh, and send a spirit of revival and encouragement and lift. Oh, my. In our world, in our nation, we need Christian people to be lifted toward heaven and uh, on top spiritually and, and keeping a good prayer life and devotional life. We need that influence in our country. So let's pray for our camps. Any other spoken requests you would have tonight you want to remember? I did not mention Retha uh, is recovering from her surgery. Let's do remember Retha. Yes, John Sabo. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Barb and Tom's son, John, just needs, desperately needs prayer. Let's remember him as we pray. All right. Maybe unspoken request, upraised hand across the... You, did you have a spoken need, Sherry? Let's remember Kenny as we pray. He was just here just a couple of Sundays ago, and, and but they live in Arkansas, so let's remember. I think it's Arkansas, isn't it? Yes. So let's remember, remember Kenny, Sherry's brother. All right. Well, you know what? Every once in a while, I like to kneel before the Lord. I don't, I don't know how you feel. Sometimes I just like to get on my knees before God, and I think we have room tonight. If you're able to kneel, if you're not, that's fine. We don't. We don't feel bad at you if you can't. But if you can, let's do it. Brother Steve, lead us. Let's join together as he leads us tonight.
be most on the need for Thank you, Lord. There's not a there's not a need, there's not a concern, there's not a problem or situation, but what you're able. Oh God. We thank you, Lord, that we can commit it to you. We don't always know what your will is, and we don't always know what your plan is, but we want you to know that we we surrender to you and our confidence is in you. Lord, we're asking that your will be Thank you, Brother Smith, for leading us in prayer tonight. And uh, let's do our best to remember these requests as the Lord would bring them to your mind. And let's continue to pray. Pray for one another. Well, I'm just going to point you to the, uh, the e-bulletin uh, just to make you aware of, of any of the upcoming events. I think several of those things are kind of on out a little bit, but uh, be mindful of this coming Sunday night is uh, our second installment of the Camp Meeting Emphasis, and uh, I know many of you would not know Brother Grile. Um, let, well, maybe I should ask this. How many have heard Brother Grile speak at some point? All right, so there are a few of you that have, many of you that have not, and uh, I, I, he is just an excellent Bible expositor, and so uh, he is not going to be a, an Adam Buckler uh, if you have that image in your mind as far as camp meeting, but maybe you could kind of imagine it being a camp meeting Bible study. And uh, he does just uh, has a wealth of information of, of the scriptures and the Lord uses him. And so uh, keep that in mind and we'll look forward to his ministry. He'll be with us actually all day on Sunday, then preaching Sunday evening. And, uh, and I, have, I have been in my mind just trying to think of some um, extra things that we could throw along with it as we think about camp meeting and what all is involved when we think of camp meeting. And so uh, one of the Sunday nights, we're planning to do a snack bar afterwards. Um, one of them, we're planning to do a pre-service. A lot of times camp meetings will have pre-services. And, uh, and so this coming Sunday night, we're going to have a healing service at about 530 and uh, I did this some time ago, <clears throat> just, uh, just kind of random almost, just anybody that wanted to, to be anointed for a physical need or for the physical need of somebody else, that uh, just to come during prayer time 
on a Sunday night, and we did that several months ago, and so we're going to do that again this coming Sunday night. If you have a special need you would like to be anointed for, we still believe in the power of healing, don't we? And I know the charismatic crowd has kind of run off with that, but I believe it's a, a scriptural thing, and we can trust the Lord. And, of course, we don't always know God's will and God's plan, but, but uh, we, we certainly believe in divine healing. And so we will plan to do that uh, on Sunday evening prior to the evening service. So keep that in mind, and uh, there are several other things on the e-bulletin that you can check out and uh, keep you updated with what's going on. Revelation chapter 2 is where we're headed tonight. As you're turning there, let me just mention that uh, I'm, I'm not going to be real long tonight. Uh, at least that's, that's the plans, and, and everyone can believe it or not, just, but... <clears throat> now listen, I want you to know, when it was really hot, Saturday afternoon I preached 15 minutes at Open Air Tabernacle. You're going to have to, yeah, that was wisdom. And uh, you're going to have to turn the heat up in here if you want me to do that at some point. <laughs> oh, but let's, uh, let's continue our series. You, you know we've been looking at Jesus' phrase, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And so we're moving to the third church. And uh, this is found in Revelation 2, verses 12 to 17. <clears throat> what truth or what message does Jesus want the church of Pergamos to hear? Well, let's notice first the context. Again, this includes the Christ and the church as we think about the context. We notice first the Christ. Jesus identifies himself in verse number 12 as the one which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So there's something important I think Jesus wants us to know about himself as he uses this imagery. It was this city in Pergamum where the Roman governor of this region had his, had his head offices. Some of the, the Roman governors had what was called the right of the sword. In fact, when the governor would walk through the streets... Uh, at times, sometimes someone would go before him carrying a large sword. And this sword basically meant that in all of the cases that were brought before him, he had the power, the governor had the power to give or take life. And uh, Jesus, knowing this, reminds the believers that he's writing to at Pergamum that Rome is not the final authority, but he is. And so the imagery of Christ's authority would, would encourage the believers that were there in that city facing persecution. Yes, the governor had authority, but Jesus tells us that he is the one with the sharp sword. I know that we don't, we don't at least yet face uh, extreme physical persecution, but Still, the imagery conveys to us a beautiful truth. God is not subject even to the throne of Satan, which, uh, which Jesus refers to in this passage. He holds the sword with two edges. That picture of a conquering Christ should propel us to remain true in face of our difficult circumstances. Can I just tell you, on this Wednesday night, we're on the winning side. The devil thought he might run this world, but God said he never would. God's still running this world, and we are on the winning side. So we not only notice the Christ, but we notice the church. The third letter goes to the church at Pergamum. Pergamum, as it would have been commonly called, was, was situated about 55 miles northeast of Smyrna, which was the church Jesus previously addressed in Revelation chapter 2. And Smyrna was about 35 miles north of Ephesus, which is the first church Jesus addresses in Revelation chapter 2. If you like geography, Pergamum is to the north and west of present-day Bergama, Turkey. It was considered the greatest city in Asia in relation to culture. It was home to an outdoor theater that could seat up to 10,000 people. 
It also is home to the second largest library in the world with not less than 200,000 volumes contained therein. It was a city full of idolatry. Found within the city was a temple to nearly every known Roman deity. If you were traveling to Pergamum and needed anything, there was an array of gods. Of course, talking in a secular sense. There was an array of gods that could supposedly meet your every need. There was Zeus, the power, the god of power, Dionysus, the god of pleasure, Demeter, the goddess of food, Asclepios, the god of healing. There was Athena, the goddess of wisdom. So there was a multitude of temples that that were to these, these gods and goddesses. One individual compared visiting Pergamum to taking a star tour in Hollywood. On those Hollywood tours out in California, you get in a vehicle and they, they show you all the houses of these famous movie stars. Well, in Pergamum, you could visit all the temples of the gods and goddesses, just depending on what you needed. You know, they could just point out this god or this goddess could help you. But it was in this wicked city, it was in this idolatrous culture where God placed a church. Isn't that fascinating? A church in the midst of a wicked culture. Just a lot like we are right here in Burlington, right here in America. Unlike Ephesus, but yet similar to Smyrna, we don't really have any biblical information concerning the beginning of this church. I guess we could surmise that, uh, you know, we, we read in Acts that Paul started the church at Ephesus. And from that fact, we speculate that, that the church of Smyrna was founded while Paul was serving there in Ephesus. And so we well, guess we can surmise that the church at Pergamum was founded simply as the church's influence began to expand beyond the city limits. You know, Jesus talks about in, in uh, Acts chapter 1, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. So basically he's saying wherever the gospel is, it goes from there and it expands out. And so if we kind of view that as, as what's happening when Paul was there at Ephesus, the gospel was there and it expanded to Smyrna, perhaps expanded then to Pergamum. And so that might be a logical explanation. And so that is the Christ and the church. But let's look quickly at the content, at what Jesus had to say to the church at this point in history. Under the content, we, we see a couple of headings. We see the divine observation and then the divine order. Let's notice first the divine observation. Certainly, certainly Jesus has his eye on the global church. We believe that, right? He, there's nothing that he does not see. And so he has his eye on the global church. But to this particular congregation, he mentions several things he's observed. Notice three. The first of which I would mention from verse 13 is their location. Jesus, both then and now, is the observer of where we are. From the church at, for the church at Pergamum, Jesus knew the believers there were living in a place, if you read those verses, that Jesus describes as the place where Satan's throne is. Again, at the end of verse 13, Jesus says, where Satan dwells. The believers were dwelling in a place where Satan was dwelling. It's interesting that the word Jesus uses when he speaks of knowing where the believers dwelled, he, he uses a word which, which means a, a permanent residence. Um, sometimes when we read in Scripture, we'll read uh, maybe the Apostle Peter talks about language, uses language about being a sojourner or... Um, being an alien in a, in, a, in a foreign land type thing, sometimes they represent us as that way. And we've been talking a little bit about that in our Sunday evening series. But here, Jesus does not use the, the, the word that means sojourner. When he talks about them dwelling there in Pergamum, he uses the word that means a permanent residence. And, and it appears that, that the believers chose to make this their home, although it would create persecution for them. And so instead of just, you know, moving when, when persecution and tribulations took place, they chose to stay. Now, 
Barclay says this, the principle of the Christian life is not escape, but conquest. And I think that's, I think that's an important thing for us to recognize. We can flourish, we can be the church where we are in the midst of our circumstances. And if the church chose to move when persecution was present, how would the church advance? How would the church advance in Pergamum if all of the believers said, boy, this is a tough place to live. This is, this is the, where the throne of Satan is. This is where Satan dwells. Boy, we ought to move somewhere else. How would the church advance in Pergamum if the whole church believed that way and they just moved on? And so the church of Pergamum chose to remain there in spite of their persecution. Jesus saw the church in Pergamum remained. There could have been those that ran, but instead they stayed. And I would just simply mention to us in passing, Jesus notices when we stay in the center of his will, even when it's not convenient or or even when circumstances make it difficult, Jesus sees when you stay in the center of his will. And I'm so grateful that he does. He knows our location. Secondly, Jesus also observed their loyalty. Notice how Jesus says in verse 13 that they holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you. Legend holds that Antipas was slowly roasted to death in a brazen bull. If you were living in this city during this time, it would certainly be easy to think that this is this is where Satan's throne is. <laughs> but Jesus looks at the church at Pergamum and he commends them for tenaciously holding on to their faith in spite of severe persecution. It was not easy to be a Christian in Pergamum. They would have faced incredible opposition and ridicule, but they did not deny their faith. And Jesus knew this loyalty they possessed. Jesus, can I tell you, also sees your loyalty when the realities of life are difficult, <clears throat> when, when circumstances come your way, maybe an exit ramp because a difficult circumstance, when the devil throws you an exit ramp and you could easily take it and you remain true, God sees your loyalty. He sees how you are tenaciously holding on to your faith. And friend, I want to tell you, if you're at an exit ramp, hold on. Hold on to the faith. God sees your loyalty. Well, what else does Jesus see? Well, it appears we move from some positive things that Jesus sees to some negative things. Thirdly, we notice that Jesus sees, maybe we could call it their lethargy or their toleration of evil. Verses 14 and 15, Jesus describes that there are some among them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam as well as the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It's probable that in regards to the teaching of Balaam, there were members of the church who were adhering to some pagan customs in an effort to escape persecution. Possible they were eating in heathen temples and participating in idol worship, which included fornication. Very possibly they were of the opinion that, that their bodies and souls were separate and what they did with their bodies did not affect their soul, which was a very prominent ideology floating around during the beginning days of the church. In fact, Sister uh, uh, Albertson just sent me a, a, a YouTube video of... of something that was addressing this Gnosticism. And it's very possible that there were people in this church that were adhering to this philosophy that, that I'm doing things to my body, but it doesn't reflect my spiritual life. This is my soul and this is my body. And so here there's a possibility that they were adhering to that, to that philosophy. There is speculation in regards to the Nicolaitans, but... But what we can know from both teachings is that the church was being tolerant of the teaching. You know, it, it truly is amazing what can be tolerated today in the name of Christianity. <clears throat> the homosexual agenda, the abortion agenda, and, and other agendas are, are tolerated even in the church world today. And what does Jesus say to the church? 
Well, we see the divine order. Jesus says in verse 16, repent. Repent. And did, did you notice the next couple words? Or else, he says. Jesus has basically stopped by the church at Pergamum. Basically, he's saying, I'm currently in your midst, but you must repent of this. And if you don't, I'm coming to deal with those who are involved with these teachings. So really what we are seeing in these verses is we see a God that is being so very faithful to his church. Calling his church back to being the church he wants them to be. Oh, I'm so, so grateful that we have a God who is so faithful to us. <clears throat> when we begin adhering to philosophies, to philosophies or adhering to different things that, that is not what God wants, we have a God who is so faithful that comes to us and makes us the person He wants us to be. He, he doesn't lose sight of us and He calls us to return to Him. So the divine order is repent. So... The next couple minutes. In light of this church, what's the call that we need to listen to? What does God want us to hear His Spirit saying to us today? There are two things I would point out in closing and quickly that Jesus could be stressing to the church. Number one, the ultimatum of their choice. Jesus establishes this when He says, or else, right? Jesus said, you must repent or else He will wage war. On those who refuse. It's the ultimatum. Jesus is establish, establishing this for the church. He knows the church. He knows what's wrong with this church. And he comes to set an ultimatum of consequences and choice. He says, this is what the answer is. This is the remedy for your church to be what it needs to be. You must repent. Repent. When it comes to things in our life that Jesus observes and then faithfully deals with, there comes with it an ultimatum, friends. Always does. We can either obey and enjoy fellowship when the faithful Holy Spirit standing in our midst, standing in our way, say, son or daughter, this is what you need to do. We can obey and enjoy fellowship or we can disobey and face the consequences. <clears throat> it's a faithful God that shows up to his church. So not only do we notice the ultimatum of their choice, but we notice the urgency of their choice. Jesus says, I will do what I will do quickly. He said, I'm going to do it quickly. <clears throat> the choice that comes our way must be dealt with immediately for us to experience consistent victory. <clears throat> Whenever the faithful Holy Spirit speaks to us about issues in our spiritual life, we must realize the ultimatum and the urgency that comes with it. Because we're at the crossroads. We're at the crossroads when He comes and speaks to us about whatever the issue is. <clears throat> we can understand the ultimatum. and We can understand the urgency. But we are also at the crossroads of a choice. So my question to us this evening is, what is the Spirit speaking to you about? <clears throat> the faithful Holy Spirit knows His church. The faithful Holy Spirit knows you. The faithful Holy Spirit knows me. His assessment of us is never wrong. You can debate it. You can deny it. But His assessment of us is always wrong accurate. And when he knows us and he comes to us and tells us anything that needs to be adjusted, we come to the crossroads of a choice. And my challenge is tonight, don't kick the can down the road. Don't delay. <laughs> when he comes to us, choose now. Choose now. To follow the instruction of the Spirit so you can enjoy His continual fellowship. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You say, Pastor Andy, that's pretty serious truth for a Wednesday night. Well, <clears throat> it was a message to a church that desperately needed to hear it. And I don't know who may need to hear it tonight. But the faithful Holy Spirit 
sees us, knows how to deal with us. He's being faithful to us. He sets the ultimatum, and we must follow. We must choose to obey, to enjoy fellowship with him. Amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the privilege of being together in your house tonight. Thank you for your presence, the testimonies of your people, the prayers that have been offered up to you. We thank you for this opportunity now that we've had to share your word. I pray that you would take it and apply it in ways that only you can and help all of us to benefit from it and draw closer to you. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you.